Hi, everyone. Donna Gambrell, President and CEO of Appalachian Community Capital and OFN Board Chair. Well, we've come to the closing plenary of the 2021 OFN Conference. Thank you all for joining us. We're in for an exciting conversation with our distinguished guests this afternoon, and I want to make sure that they have an opportunity to talk about a wide range of issues impacting the CDFI industry. You know, this is a moment for CDFIs. Our profile is high, our funding level is unprecedented, and our growth is rapid. Our task is to turn this moment into a movement. You've spent the last three days listening to some of the wisest and most experienced people in the field explore how you align money, people, and systems to manage your growth and impact successfully. So we'll close this conference by hearing from both experienced and budding voices in the CDFI field on how they're experiencing this moment, what they see ahead, how we should invest to build finance justice, finance change. Please join me in welcoming the panelists to this virtual stage. We'll first start off in introducing Bill Bynum, who is the CEO of Hope Enterprise Corporation, Hope Federal Credit Union, and the Hope Policy Institute. Also on the panel is Marla Belonik, who is the president and CEO of the National Association for Latino Community Asset Builders, and Lakota Vogel, who is the executive director for Four Bands Community Fund. Welcome, everyone. You know, before we dive in, it's often really helpful to start at the beginning. I think for so many of us, where we started has a big role in playing uh, where we end up in terms of our career, our life decisions regarding our life's work. And so I really want everyone to really talk about that, the beginning, your beginnings. Talk about your personal history. Where did you grow up? How did you get into this business of tackling social justice through finance? What were some of the critical moments or events or other factors that influenced your career path? Those are a lot of questions, but this really is talking about your personal story. So if we can start with Lakota Vogel. Lakota. Thank you, Donna, and thank you everybody for being here at the closeout of this session, this really great conference. Um, as mentioned, I'm Lakota Vogel. I'm the executive director of Four Bands Community Fund. Um, we're located on the Cheyenne River Sioux Indian Reservation in North Central South Dakota. I'm a member of the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe. Um, I was born and raised here on a cattle ranch living about 30 miles from the nearest town. We, we played a lot of card and board games as a rural family with a very limited disposable income. I remember grocery store trips for a family of six and getting to the checkout line and being assigned to take items back to the aisle as the till rang past $100. Um, however, I never remember being embarrassed of this or going hungry. We would often play Monopoly when my cousins would come over and remember, I remember getting uh, the mortgage card when you're drawing and uh, asking my mom what it meant. And she answered, I don't know. So whether she truly didn't know or just didn't want to explain it to a nine-year-old, it, it was clear in the, in the tone of her voice, the concept of a mortgage was inconsequential to our reality. Therefore, as kids, we just decided to remove all of the mortgage references from the game. So I reflect on these moments in hindsight as I sit in this chair as a leader of a CDFI and think about how it's influenced my career and the choices I've made. And I guess I just want to push back and ask all of you to think of that. Like, how many of you have ever played Mon Monopoly? And I'm sure you're all thinking back. Uh, I'm sure it was during a blizzard or some other catastrophic event, such as Thanksgiving, where you're forced to spend time with your relatives. Um, it's a game which you develop a thirst for fake capitalism and heartlessly bankrupting your family members. Um, so now imagine you arrive late to Thanksgiving and the game has started without you and all your cousins have already started playing. And as you scan the board to see what properties are left, you see all the pro prime properties are bought up. Uh, the monopolized board is exactly where modern day Native American economies have started from. All of our economic infrastructure has been, was wiped off the board during colonization and 
few centuries later, we were all invited to play. So at which point, all the cards have been dealt, the rules have been written, and the best properties were bought up. They eventually gave us back Baltic Avenue, if you remember that avenue on the, the, Monopoly, the Monopoly board after some negotiations. So the rest of my story really involves four bands and the work we do in investing $25 million in loans to Baltic Avenue and to all of those individuals who step onto this monopolized board with courage. We realize at Four Bands and in my history of running this organization that capital will never solve poverty, but we know that rewriting the rules will. So my story short, I'm new in this and I will give my time to Bill Bynum. <laughs> Bill. Um, thanks, Lakota. Thanks, everyone. This is a great opportunity to talk to a group of people who are making such a huge difference in this country. Um, it's amazing to see where this industry is now from where it was when I stumbled into it about some 40-ish uh, years ago. Um, you know, but even before that, since I was a kid, I've always been one of those people who asked why. You know, why, why do people need money? Why, um, if I've got wood and you've got a hammer, why can't we work together and help each other? And who made up these crazy rules in the first place? And so I guess that's probably why I became an organizer, um, not a financier. I remember um, when I first started working here in, the, in Mississippi, someone introduced me as a financier and I kind of laughed. And um, I always thought of myself as an organizer. Uh, um, I, as a student, I would organize on behalf of uh, students, right? In college, I, I led a Black student organization um, that advocated for equity and admission and retention of students and faculty. Um, and I um, was on my way to law school. I thought I wanted to be the next Thurgood Marshall, and I stumbled into an organization that was working to help employees who were losing their jobs uh, because of nothing that they've done wrong, but because um, country companies outside of the U.S. was paying lower, high, lower wages and extracting more profits. And so we decided to help those uh, low-income workers, women, people of color, rural folks buy their businesses. And we went to knock on the bank store, and um, you can imagine the response that we got. It was not favorable um, uh, at all. And so a group of, um, uh, group of employees had a bake sale and $77 became the first deposits of Self-Help Credit Union, which is now a multi-billion dollar CDFI, um, helping millions of people across the country. Um, and so it's, but it, I still see myself as an organizer now. I'm, um, I moved to Mississippi and started working in the Delta, one of the um, most economic distressed and racially divided places in the nation, and I saw so many people who, no, for no reason of their own, were on the outside of the economy looking in. And so we decided to uh, do what we could to organize resources for them. It just so happens that one of the things that I ended up organizing was money uh, and capital, but that's a means to an end. Um, we really exist to make sure that things like where one's born um, who their family is, their gender, their race, don't determine their ability or the ability of kids to climb the economic ladder. And so that's, um, uh, but that, um, what I'm doing today really builds on, you know, the crazy questions I drove my mom mad with as a child. Why, why, why not? If someone's got to make the rules, why not us? And I really think that's a question that we need to continue to ask. And I suspect it's one that has put us in a position, as Donna, you say, uh, um, it's, this is not a moment. We are really on the verge of making all the work that we've done over this year is a movement that's going to transform this country. And so with that, uh, I'll hand the baton to uh, Marla. And before you do- Thanks Bill, so much, let's, Bill. Let's, um, uh, you know, yeah. it's, oh. it's really challenging. Marla, Sorry. Marla, I was going to ask Bill one quick question, because I think for a lot of people, I mean, he talked about 
being in this business for decades. And yet, Bill, there was actually the movement even before you became involved in the CDFI industry. Can, for those who aren't familiar with that, can you just give us a brief history of just the CDFI movement uh, and why that was so important for you to, to step into that space? You know, it, it was funny. Again, I've, I've, when I was a kid, I remember going into my, um, with my grandmother to a credit union that was in the base, within the garage of my vice principal where the black folks um, could be treated with respect because they couldn't get banking services um, at the, at the local bank in town. And I just saw people cobbling the resources together to help each other. And we didn't think of that as a CDFI, but minority credit unions, minority banks, loan funds. I remember when I joined, I think we were the National Association of Community Development Loan Funds. I was on the board of what was once OFN. And there was a handful of, of us do-gooders that, again, felt it was important to push against uh, policies and practices that undercut uh, opportunity for, for low-income people, for people of color, uh, for others. And I really think that's what the movement has evolved from. It was loan funds, it was minority credit unions, minority banks, it was native um, uh, loan funds, um, it was housing groups, but all of those entities were the predecessors of who we are today. And when in the 90s, uh, actually, I moved to Mississippi. I ran a loan, a micro loan fund in North Carolina, but I moved to Mississippi because Bill Clinton was from this part of the country, and my organization was working in Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, and um, he had come up with this crazy idea of creating a government entity that would support a thousand um, micro loan funds and a hundred community development banks, and that was the uh, that was the beginning of the CDFI fund, and you know, and and so it's it's again, it's really been amazing to see how that has evolved, and more and more we've seen people recognize that the disparities um, that limit opportunity for so many people is in no one's self-interest. Uh, even though we see all this division in the world today, I think we also are seeing, uh, and OFN conference has been a great example. No way you'd see. You know, the chairman of Bank of America, the Treasury Secretary, heads of Google, heads of major corporations in the country, the business roundtable saying that Black Lives Matter, that reparations are something we should look hard at, that we know that this Black and Brown folks are an emerging majority, but no longer the minority, and we depend on them for jobs, for revenue. So I just think it's really fascinating to see where we are and what has come out of those, those ragtag loan funds and credit unions. Thank you. And, and thank you. I think that history, that recap of history of the CDFI movement is important because it also underscores where the, we started as an industry, where we are today and what more we need to do. Uh, just very important as a, to remind everybody, uh, there's still a long road ahead <laughs> that we've got to conquer. Marla. Please tell us about your story. Thank you, Donna. And these are two very challenging acts to follow. So I'll try to keep it um, brief. But, um, you know, I think it, it's a different pathway that I had. I um, was born in Panama and I grew up splitting my childhood between um, Washington and Panama. Um, and so I always thought I would work in some sort of international field and I went. Uh, to school, actually the same, Lisa and I graduated from the same graduate program um, through Johns Hopkins, which is focused on um, international affairs. And so um, I was sort of on a path to do something around European trade, something that has very little to do with um, CDFIs or even, you know, U.S. Uh, domestic work. And um, I have to credit a professor of mine who introduced me to microfinance, um, first in the international context, um, and I, you know, was very, very lucky to have professors at, at school who were, you know, legends in the field, um, you know, internationally and even recognized here in the U.S., um, including the, the founder of Acción International, from which um, Acción U.S. was born. And what I really was struck by was how this kind of 
approach to development is not a paternalistic approach. It's an approach that uh, connects individuals to tools that will allow them to have agency over their future and their destiny. And that is really what attracted me to this field, um, you know, both internationally and, and domestically. And so um, as I sought out to still stay in the international realm, but in this field of, of microfinance and microenterprise development, um, I realized I had no practical experience and actually took my very first job as a loan officer at a Washington DC based CDFI called Latino Economic Development Center, which I ultimately, after a, you know, a, a career in between that point, um, came to lead for almost a decade before joining NowCab. So it was kind of a, a you know, serendipitous experience, but I, I still feel that that is what sets our angle apart is that it's not, um, it's not sort of a condescending view of, of development, but rather um, a connector. So we are connecting people with resources and with, you know, with capital, um, but not assuming that we know best for their futures. And so that that's the piece of it that really resonates for me, um, because I always, you know, my experience has been with the clients that we've worked with over time, and that now NowCab's members serve, um, you know, these are not individuals that have any challenges in terms of working hard, in terms of having amazing entrepreneurial ideas. Um, really what's missing is the capital that, you know, others in, in other parts of society re rely on friends and family for. So I really feel like we're here to sort of provide that capital, but we're not um, assuming that we know what's best um, for individuals and their families. Yes, thank you. You know, it's interesting that each of you have really talked about recognizing at a very early stage in your lives a construct, if you will, that was simply not equitable in, as it relates to communities that were being marginalized, people of color, and others, and that there was an early recognition of that. Um, like you all, I mean, I, I started probably, probably my path has been serendipitous as well. I mean, I, I spent a lot of time on the bank regulatory side as part of my career, but having grown up in D.C., born and raised, mostly raised in D.C., and spending a lot of time living in neighborhoods that um, uh, were very, very marginalized, continue to be marginalized, frankly, even many, many decades later. And, and for me, that first introduction or real introduction to the CDFI industry was when I went to live and work in Louisiana after Hurricane Katrina and got a chance to work with folks like Bill and, and others, so many others who were on the ground just doing some extraordinary work. I, I tell people all the time I had an epiphany because I knew the construct was not the right one, uh, but that maybe there was an opportunity for me to play a role in kind of trying to right size that. So I think we all share that passion, that commitment, if you will, in saying that there is a place for all of us in addressing equitable lending, economic justice, making sure communities that have been traditionally marginalized have that economic self-sufficiency that's required, frankly, in this country. Uh, to create wealth, to build assets. So thank you all for that first question and introducing yourselves and talking about your personal history. Bill, from where you sit now, what, what does it mean for uh, this, this motto for the conference this year, finance justice, finance change? What does that, that mean to you and what's unique for you about this specific moment uh, in the industry? What did you think was impossible that has been achieved in these last, especially in these last 24 months or so? Donna, I think we, leaders in this field, I think share um, a, 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 an audacity uh, as part in our DNA. So I uh, think we spoke about this earlier. I initially said probably there's not very much that that it, I thought was impossible. I mean, I think if we thought that we couldn't do this, um, you know, we wouldn't be the right people for this work. I think we, we kind of are, 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 are wired to, to blow through uh, walls and create opportunity. Uh, that, that said, it's been a fascinating past 18 months, particularly. Um, the, uh, the idea that a majority of the country would now be acknowledged that 
there are there is systemic discrimination that Black Lives um, Matter um, uh, that that wouldn't have been the case um, not though so long ago and while while that support is has has lessened it's still I think a majority of the of the country and. And, and, and that's something to build upon. Um, the idea that there would be $27 billion in legislation passed last year that focuses on routing resources through CDFIs, if you count the PPP uh, allocations for CDFIs, is mind blowing. Um, and, and, and the billions of dollars in private investment in CDFIs, I think as, as, as audacious as we are, um, that's beyond what I think we imagine. I, I remember when uh, organized in a meeting in Birmingham and, and LFN and several uh, leaders came down to Birmingham to talk about the um, idea of a billion dollars uh, as a minimum for the CDFI fund. Um, it was kind of a stretch. I don't think we'll ever uh, satis be satisfied for um, the pittances that we've gotten in the past before. And so I'm really, um, you know, I, I, I'm glad to be surprised to have my, um, my, my limits pushed in terms of what's possible. Great, thank you. Well, Calder, for you, what does finance justice, finance change mean? And you've talked about, uh, just as a, to pick up on a thread that, that Bill has already spoken about, just how uh, the Black Lives Movement influenced a lot of your thinking as it relates to how you're supporting Native communities as well. So if you can talk about that a little bit, that would be great. Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> prior to this moment in history, I had succumbed to like a tyranny of thinking that the formula, that the pie was only so big, right? And I had adopted, without knowing it, a scarcity mindset, thinking that uh, the multifactorial work that we do with solving the complex issues of poverty in Indian country end up causing complexity fatigue when you start talking about it to large audiences. And I think for sure the Black, the Black Lives Movement has allowed us to build up a platform for us and lifted our voices together. And we've been able to talk about our issues, but in, without the scarcity mindset and saying there are enough resources out there for everyone and to stop believing in that. Um, I only can talk to special interest impact groups that want to invest in rural and want to invest in native and almost not feel guilty about taking a, a slice of the pie that somebody has told me was too big for my region or my area, right? And I think we overcame that in this moment to, with the generosity of spirit. Um, we looked around us and, and thought about what are we uniquely capable of and we identified our strengths as a CDFI and also looked across the region to find partners in this field so you know other native cdfis serving smaller rural communities so we could all sort of uplift our voices and yell as loud as we could so people could still see us and believe in investing in us and we've been you know meeting um two times a week for over the 18 months just to continue to uplift our narrative and share the same narrative for the region and i think also just knowing that there are more resources out there um i don't have a background in finance and you know i'm a social worker master's of social work. So I'm a renegade social worker trying to get capital into our communities. And a part of that is um, learning all these new tools that are out there. But, you know, I was talking to a funder once and explaining, when you hear us say, we can't get capital, we can't get capital. Um, what does, you know, in a really vulnerable conversation with them saying, what does that make? What do you hear when I say something like that? Because I'm afraid you're hearing me say something about my you know, a business model is is risky or something about my market is risky. And what this person said back to me was that, no, she, what they what they heard was, we know there's capital out there. It exists. It exists in DAFs and it exists in endowments, for example. So, you know, what we've taken this moment to do is learn about new financial tools that just have not been available or accessible to us. For example, with the DAF model, the donor advice fund model, speaking to a few investors who have DAFs, when you're given a choice to invest a DAF, I think we lost Lakota for a minute. We'll come back to her because I think she froze for just a minute. Marla, I'm going to turn to you. 
finance justice, finance change, what does it mean for you? And, and do you think that there are some components of that that were impossible that have been achieved for you? Yeah, I mean, I think a couple of thoughts. One is just the groups that are being assembled around supporting the work that we do, to me, look very different than they had in the past. I think in the past, when we referred to corporate support for the work that CDFIs do, we were primarily and almost exclusively talking about banks um, and banks, you know, who had an, an agenda to achieve um, CRA credits and, and, of course, you know, wanting to to um, lend in communities that they could penetrate more easily through CDFIs. But the groups that are coming to the table now, and I do have to commend Lisa for her leadership on this, are of an entirely different um, background. You know, you've got Google, you've got Twitter. Um, I was on a call that Netflix was participating in, and it's just um, really opened my mind. And I think, you know, it's a real opportunity for us all that we should absolutely take to engage different kinds of corporate funders um, that we may not have thought of, um, you know, being players prior to more recent times. So that's something that I think is, I don't know that I thought it was impossible, but it just um, has been pleasantly surprising to see these groups um, engaged and interested in understanding the work that we do and wanting to learn more and committing to communities. I think that's something that's very um, different and that I hope sort of continues on. And then secondly, I just also wanted to say that the Black Lives Matter movement, um, you know, has really elevated uh, the racial and ethnic wealth divide. And I feel like the groups that we speak to are really sort of keenly honing in on that. And that, um, although it's not necessarily so different, it's just sort of more acute. And I'm really um, paying attention to that. And I think what I hope we can be careful about, or I would sort of be speaking to corporate partners through this message right here, is just to not sort of tokenize those opportunities. Um, we're just coming off of the heels of Hispanic Heritage Month. And I feel like I've been on a speaking circuit um, almost every single day for the past um, 30 days. And so, you know, what I want to see is what happens after September, uh, sorry, excuse me, October 15th. Are those corporations still wanting to hear our input, still wanting to engage, or was it just sort of to be able to say that you had a Latino organization represented in the conversation during that 30-day period? And, and I don't believe that that's really where, you know, most of our, our partners are coming from, but it's something that I'm paying attention to because I really want to make sure that it's, um, you know, Hispanic Heritage Year, not Hispanic Heritage Month um, or years, I should say. So those are sort of some thoughts that I have running through my head around the question that you asked, Donna. Yes, I, and that's great, Marla, because you're, you're really talking about sustainability as well, sustainability not only of interest, but sustainability of engagement uh, by investors. And so if we can continue with that thread, and Lakota is back, I want to get back to you, Lakota, about the finance justice, finance change question as well, because I know you didn't get a chance to, to finish that. But but Marla, when, we, when you're looking at that, I mean, we're seeing unprecedented interest in uh, public and private sector investment into CDFIs right now. Uh, the federal government is debating a multi-trillion dollar spending proposal that would provide billions of dollars of new capital uh, to CDFIs and the communities that we serve. And so when you talk about the work, the conversations, the meetings that you're having with investors, whether they're public or private sectors, and really trying to push them to also move the needle, um, you know, what do CDFIs and others need to do to continue this momentum that we have uh, in the industry right now? What, what are your recommendations? What are your suggestions? I think, honestly, it's really about continuing to measure and, and refining our ability to measure and demonstrate the impact of the work that we're doing. Um, it is an extra layer of work, and we're all, you know, inundated with an, an incredible amount of work to reach the communities that we care about. Um, but I think really our ability to measure and demonstrate the impact. And I also think it, there's a lot to be said for stories. I think, um, you know, a lot of times when we connect with groups that are looking to 
support the work that we do. You know, you can throw out all kinds of statistics, but it doesn't really connect until you've provided a specific story of how the capital has been used and how it's impacted a group or an individual or a community or a business or a homeowner. Um, so I, I think we have to sort of strike that balance, but really be able to speak to the work that we're doing in terms of the importance and the effect that it's having on the communities that we're working in. Thank you. But I want to get back to you because we were talking about the, just the definition of finance justice, finance change. And one of the questions that I didn't get a chance to ask you, uh, but would love to hear your response now is what is it that, uh, you know, that you thought was impossible during these past 18 months that has been achieved with all the work that you've done. And I love that analogy that you have of, of working with a monopoly board, if you will, when you look at communities uh, and you can really see that even in the disparities in playing monopoly, uh, the have and have nots, if you will, those who have and those who uh, uh, are, are aggressive in getting uh, and leaving those out. So what, what, what has been achieved in your mind? I'm, I'm sorry, I cut out. This should be a, a PSA for investment in rural broadband infrastructure. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think just to get back to it, I, it's mainly just understanding that there used to be prior to this, the scarcity mindset, right? And so I felt like as a leader that asking for a bigger slice of the pie, so to say, was felt like greed, right? And too much, but what, what the needs are, are what they are, right? And I don't need to justify those. And so it's going beyond sort of um, governmental entities and looking for those private partnerships, which we have seen you know, lots and lots of more interest in our space more so. So it sort of just helped validate our experience as well as uh, mentioning so the Black Lives Movement has also validated our experience and amplified our voices within this space. So we've, we've looked at other tools like the donor advised funds and really we're pushing on that angle right now, just wanting to be a choice. So as an investor, if you're investing in it, oftentimes if you wanna select special interest groups, Native Americans aren't even in a choice on the ballot or whatever it is, the, the application they fill out. And so little things like that of knowing where we're left off or we're just grouped together with other things and it's not specialized to reach us, knowing those angles of where to advocate, I, I think I would have never predicted that that would be a role I would be playing, but I'm currently happy to be in that space and continue to, to press the buttons where they're needed. But I also need allies in this because I don't know what I don't know. And so I've got to constantly be exposed to the different sectors within the financial industry to know where we're underestimated, underrepresented and underestimated. Thank you. Thank you. You know, Bill, you, you said recently that as we look at the changes that are happening in the industry, as we're anticipating additional changes to come, that CDFIs need to grow up fast. Right, uh, but you know, it really takes a different set of tools uh, to operate in this multi-billion dollar industry. Uh, and so when you think about closing the wealth gap, closing the racial wealth gap, uh, addressing issues related to poverty uh, and so many others that we are all grappling with within the industry, what do you see as those, what are those financial tools? And what do CDFIs need to do in using those tools, better leveraging those tools to have impact? You know, Donna, I go back to what I said earlier. Um, I, I, I don't consider myself a financier. Fortunately, I've got some of the smartest, best financial minds working with me that keeps me out of trouble. But I, I think, you know, there's only so many ways that you can make a loan. Um, it's, I don't think it's the, you know, we, I don't think we want to overcomplicate it. it. It's about access. It's, it's about opening doors that so many others uh, take for granted. And, and I, I want to go back to a point that Lakota made. I, I really think this, this is our time. Um, crisis, crises force attention. We, you and I saw it after Hurricane Katrina, billions of dollars came into the region. Unfortunately, billions of dollars went into the pockets of more wealthy um, communities, and there's still people on the Gulf Coast in New Orleans who have not gotten fully back on their feet. Same thing after the financial crisis. We're seeing it now, trillions of dollars going in the economy, and I think we've got to really dust off our advocacy muscles. If you're not 
if, if you're a CDFI and you're not standing up for what is important and advocating for opportunity and policies and practices, not just public, but banks, corporations that benefit and don't exploit and extract from the communities we serve, then I think you're a fake CDFI. Um, you know, this is our time. And so how do we leverage it? How do we sustain it? How do we make sure those trillions don't widen what are already unsustainable wealth gaps? 100 to one for black families with children compared to white families with children. And so I think we got to do what Dakota, Lakota described so powerfully. Don't, don't believe the hype. There's capital out there that has been extracted from or withheld from or hoarded by those who uh, have benefited for so long. And that's, it's hard to let that go. And so we've got to work together. It's alliances. Um, you know, we work with NALCAP um, and native CDFIs, rural CDFIs, uh, uh, to make sure that there is persistent poverty language in legislation now that wasn't there. CDFIs are more prominently mentioned in, in language, um, in legislative language. Um, also see a lot of alliances that I don't think many of us would expect it with some unlikely bedfellows. Uh, I, I, I think about work I did very early in North Carolina with Senator Jesse Helms, who no one would mistake for someone who's uh, a supporter of racial uh, opportunity. But we went to him and made the case that credit unions should be able to make business loans. They were not able to do it before. And so he saw the bootstrapping, lift yourself up by the boots, even though a lot of folks we work with didn't have boots. He helped get legislation passed that opened door for credit unions to do business lending. Just this week, a coalition of Latino, Black, low-income credit unions and others just unlocked resources that would have otherwise left millions of low-income people and people of color behind. We worked together, um, and in a very short time, the, the regulatory body of credit unions have proposed guidance that will open up that opportunity um, more widely so that there's more equitable access. We could not have done that by ourselves. It's going to take coalitions coming together, and those coalitions aren't always going to look uh, like, 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 like you or me. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, we certainly saw that even as we looked at the, had these beginning conversations about appropriations for the CDFI fund, for example, in Treasury, where you saw different groups come together. Um, the African American Alliance of CDFI CEOs, NALCAP, uh, OISTA, and other organizations where we certainly, I think all, there was always a mutual respect for one another, but we kind of worked in our own lanes for a long time. I think there really is this power uh, in coming together in that collaboration, and that, that certainly is something that needs to continue and perhaps even uh, increased more. Marla, I've certainly heard you say uh, when we talk about the advocacy piece is now is not the time to sit on the sidelines and think about, oh, woe is me, should we, should we be doing this? <laughs> you know, this is, this is now the time to raise voices, uh, to really have an influence, to say these are the types of policies, programs, practices that will knock down the barriers uh, that have been in place for so long and too long uh, a time in many communities, uh, low income, rural communities of color and others. Uh, so talk a little bit about that. Again, that, that need to really raise up and raise our voices, what we need to do going forward. Absolutely. And I think this sort of speaks to learning how to navigate systems. I don't think that advocacy is something that um, Honestly, most people are aware of sort of how to engage, even at a local level, at a city council level, county council level, um, let alone at the federal level. Um, and so that's something that I just think is so important. I think for all CDFIs who um, may or may not consider advocacy to be a part of their daily grind, it, it absolutely must be. And it was interesting when we had our prep call Bill said, you know, oh, I don't know if I lead a CDFI or an advocacy organization. And I think by, you know, by force, we all need to be leading um, organizations that are simultaneously CDFIs and advocacy organizations because advocacy is what propels forward the work that we're doing. You know, if we're not able to have laws that support and legislation that supports the work that we do, 
you know, we could provide the most incredible services and it will all be undermined by policy that does not um, advance what we're looking to advance. And so, you know, I would just urge um, all members of OFN to really sort of learn this process and figure out how you can engage, whether that's signing on to letters, whether that's testifying, whether that's um, you know, just reading up and learning more and sort of bringing that point of view to meetings that you're in. It's so, so critical, um, you know, and I'll just make a plug for NALCAP that this is something that we are really committed to. And we have a team that's dedicated solely to policy and advocacy, both in terms of representing our membership, but also building the capacity of our members to advocate on their own behalf. And so that's something that we are just very, very committed to, um, you know, and it's, it's such a game changer and it's so, so critical that we be involved in that way. Thank you. You know, one of the questions I have is this, and, and you know, we've talked about working across the spectrum, uh, across the industry, working with different st stakeholders, but there's also this piece where we need to turn the mirror on ourselves within the industry uh, we pride ourselves uh, as being uh, organizations that assist residents and others in becoming wealth builders. And, and yet there still remains this very large gap uh, between the have and have nots. So what do we need to do? What are we doing to actually go deeper within our own organizations to have more impact? And again, if there are, you know, Bill, I'll throw it back to you, start with you. If there are some specific examples, initiatives that are underway at Hope right now that you want to talk about that really go to the heart of saying, you know what, we've, we've done a great job for these last few decades, but this is the time, this is the moment where we need to do something different, uh, something more in terms of how we're reaching uh, our own customers. You know, it, it is it's unfortunate that as, you know, the same conditions that created the resource, the opportunity for resources that we are looking at in support of the CDFI sector, uh, those same conditions have put a great deal of stress on our organizations and on, on us individually. Um, and we... Um, have had to step back and really ask ourselves hard questions about our infrastructure. Are we in a position where we are ready to deploy the significantly more monies and resources? And, and can we do that in a way that doesn't turn us into just a bank? Um, and, 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 and are we pushing deep enough? And what are the things that we need to do to both deploy these large amounts of resources, but also to make sure that the impact is what it needs to be to make us uh, true CDFIs. And so we have we 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 are experiencing growing pains. I suspect many in the uh, across the country are. Um, we need to take advantage of technology, but but not lose sight of the fact that we are dealing with people who have been so dismissed, so disregarded, so disrespected. And if we are not treating them with respect and helping them to uh, be their financial problem solvers, then I think we lose our soul as CDFIs. And so I think that, again, I think the technology is there. We have to be smart enough. And I think we are, can be, and, and can bring people on who can help us adapt and, and put in place the infrastructure to grow. It's not easy, but we can do that. I think the hard thing is to keep our soul, to keep our mission front and center as we, as we take that next step forward as CDFIs. Absolutely, Bill. And um, Donna has dropped off. Um, we're working on the tech issue, but I'm going to take over as moderator temporarily. Um, so I'll hand the same question to Lakota just with regard to sort of what are you doing in terms of looking inward um, as a CDFI and, and you know, deepening your impact? Um, what are some sort of practical examples that you can give um, to echo Bill's sentiments? Yeah, I, thank you. Um, you know, I, I'm going to reference um, Senator John Lewis in this instance, and he really inspired me in a talk that I heard him give. And it was about, um, he basically said, you know, the, the amount of technology we have available and what we're able to do is completely different than what he had available during the civil rights movement. And he gave a good statement and it was like, they put water on us 
during the civil rights movement and we kept coming. He said they set, you know, sick dogs on us and we kept coming, but they gave us grants and we stopped coming. Right. So I think a part of that is that we, you know, if we find ourselves standing still in moments, um, but not keep pushing forward and in introspection, like looking in and changing the way that we do things, because I think we've all adopted financial models that are have residual racism built into them, including the five C's of credit, which I just heard a panel prior to this talk about blowing that up, which I think is true. Um, we all have to look at that to ensure that we haven't adopted those residual models. Um, and I think many of us took this time to do that. So at four bands, we did a regression analysis on 105 of our small business loans to see what was mitigating risk. And of course, collateral and equity were not predictors of risk. It, it came down to things like commitment to business, how we measured it, um, character of the business owner um, and how we measured that, which all goes back to the perception of, of our individuals underwriting these loans and the relationships we have because how we perceive our community, which is important, is how we proceed, right? So being proximate to the opportunities within our community is really important. And I think that that's, you know, and then now we've got to learn to scale that, like Bill was mentioning, how do we continue to hold those values and that mission front and center and scale it is going to be the challenge for us for the next decade, especially in rural areas, as we need to learn to adopt the technology that Bill mentioned as well. But I think with all the support from all of us in the industry, I think we can, we can effectively do that together. I think that's such an interesting point because part of what, oh, Donna's back. <laughs> but I was just going to say. I'm back is Seth Julian. <laughs> so, Lakota, okay. Bill, you and I all work in rural areas and we all have issues with broadband. But I'm not, I'm not in Appalachia right now. We still had some technology issues. I'm glad I'm back, though. Uh, and we'll, we'll, we certainly got them solved for these last few minutes. Thank you. Uh, as always, for everybody just continuing. You're just true professionals. I love it. <laughs> um, we're getting ready to close out, though, with the very last question. And, and you know, again, this has been a wonderful discussion about uh, the road ahead. Uh, and I always say we're climbing a mountain, but we're not at the top of the mountain yet. Uh, we've still got a long way to go as it relates in the, uh, in the industry. And while we see certainly, uh, you know, some great things that are happening, it, it's incumbent upon all of us, I think, in the industry not to uh, be complacent, not to say, let's stop here. We've, we've done as much as we can do. So we talked about in the early part of this what seemed impossible for you all and, you, and what was achieved, as, even though it seemed impossible. I'm going to ask you now, what seems impossible or hard to do at this moment, but it's still urgent? for each of you in terms of what you're doing in your own organizations or what you're doing collectively with other CDFIs. So Marla, I'll start with you. Great. Um, so I was just gonna make one quick comment about Lakota's uh, last remarks, just that it made me think about the fact that sort of what we uh, base our decision-making on is the uniqueness of the fact that we can be or that we use subjective measures versus the traditional measures that a bank might use. And I just hadn't really thought about it until she said it, that it really crystallized for me around how careful we have to be about our subjectivity. So I just wanted to make that quick comment. But with regard to the question that you just asked, I would say, you know, something that I still see a real challenge around is um, representation. You know, there are over a thousand CDFIs in the United States and a really, really small subset of those are Latino-led and Latino-facing, and that is something that we at NALC have are really committed to changing. We are really putting our pedal to the metal with helping to get as many of our members certified as CDFIs as we can and having access to everything that that certification brings. And we also really want to make sure that um, we are coming together as a coalition. And so, you know, this is something that, you know, um, you and Bill are very involved in, in terms of African-American-led CDFIs, and, and we are looking to mirror that in the Latino um, community of lenders and CDFIs um, through NALCAB. And so that's something that I'll just put out as a teaser, as something that we have going on um, and that we're planning for and putting the foundation under um, and so we look forward to working collaboratively with AAA um, in that vein as well. That's great. And we welcome you as always, Marla. Lakota, what's urgent for you? 
um, mortgage capital in Indian country is urgent. It seems impossible because the mortgage industry is just immovable and the existing products cannot see literally value the 56 million acres of trust land across America that most Native Americans inhabit. And so it feels impossible at the moment, but is urgent. We need homes and we need more financial institutions to enter the space uh, with us. Great, thank you very much. And, and that's something we didn't talk a lot about during this session is the housing piece. But again, so much of this is, is interlocked in terms of housing, small business, education, health. It's all part of the holistic, uh, you know, puzzle, if you will, that makes up community economic development. Bill, what's urgent for you? What's keep, what's keeping you up at night, especially? <laughs> oh. No, it's 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 again, it's kind of kind of strange. Uh, it's we're excited, we're thankful, but we can't be satisfied. Um, countries hurting. So many communities that we serve are hurting. You saw forty percent of black businesses close. They businesses of color during the past year and a half. You see wealth being stripped, housing, people not getting access to federal dollars to keep to stay in their homes because of policymakers that are too um, just to, to, to unfortunately neglect and ignore their needs. And and so it's urgent that we stay vigilant. Uh, we we are you know we, we're financial institutions, but we're in the, in the empowerment business. Um, you know, don't tell anybody, but 90% of our members of our credit union voted in the past two elections. When people feel like they have a stake, when they have an opportunity to support their families, to climb the economic ladder, they go and hold their local PTA and their town boards accountable. They vote. And, and at this time when that is looking... Uh, people are making it harder and harder for the communities we serve to vote. We've got to do everything we can to lift them up and, and help them um, hold their government accountable. This is, this is another inflection point. It's a transformational moment. It, you, um, Lakota talked about John Lewis. Um, John Lewis uh, was amazing. I heard recently uh, a reference to a story I've heard before about when he was a young boy and he was and 10 of his um, uh, family and young other kids were in a house and a storm came through. Imagine the Wizard of Oz, the way he tells it, the, the, the house was lifting up off the ground and the, and, and the only adult told him to hold hands and they went from one side of the house to the other side of the house to hold the house down and eventually the storm went away and the house was settled. But it took them coming together and holding hands but she said, she said, other storms are going to come and we need to hold hands. We got to hold hands across this industry. We got to hold hands with those unlikely bad fellows. Um, th this is our time. We, we, um, it, it's a great time, but we, we can't be satisfied. There's a lot of work left to be done. Mm -hmm. I love those last words that, that other storms are coming uh, and we need to be prepared for that. Uh, we need to hold hands, we need to hold tight, move together as, as one, uh, because we shouldn't be resting on our laurels, that's for sure. Uh, there are more, more things and more surprises and more things that are unexpected that are coming around that corner. Thank you all. This has been a great conversation. I really appreciate it. You know, we, we, you all have talked about this, but again, I think my, my closing thoughts is that we really need to move forward. Uh, by leveraging the best practices of business, of our business, all the business that we do within the industry on behalf of economic justice and on behalf of racial justice. But as an industry, we shouldn't be satisfied uh, about where we are in this moment. If anything, we, we must look at each day as the start of a new race. You know, we're starting all over again. We're starting at the beginning. Um, Frederick Douglass said that if there is no struggle, there is no progress. And I, I deeply believe in that. So each of us must be prepared for a continuing struggle to change the policies, the practices, the programs that act as barriers for too many of the communities that we serve. I have thoroughly enjoyed talking to each of you today. I know the attendees have as well. I think this was a fantastic way to close out the conference. Uh, thank you all 
for your insight, your perspectives, but most of all, for your continued hard work, whether you have been in the industry for decades or only for a few years. Uh, the work that you do is so important day in and day out. And the encouragement that you give to so many throughout the industry is really what inspires all of us to continue putting one foot in front of the other. Thank you again. I'm gonna turn this over to Lisa and let her close out the conference. Thank you all.